Hello and welcome to ADTV. Today you catch up with us on the banks of the River Trent, joined by Phil Spinks, who's hopefully going to talk us through a few very simple but effective barbel fishing tactics. Now I guess, Phil, the first thing you notice, I've never ever been here, and you sort of, you rock up and you realise what a big, powerful river it is. Definitely, it's, this is a tidal stretch of the River Trent. Um, so the approach we use, everything is a little bit stepped up. You know, your, your, your rods are, are slightly heavier than your normal feeder rods. You're probably using a slightly stronger line to deal with the, the boulders and the snags that are in this river. Um, feeders have got to be heavier, do they? They'll just get washed down the yeah. river. E everything is, is barbel fishing, but on steroids. It's slightly, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's slightly it's certainly a, um, a little bit different from our, you know, local Wensum. It, it, it's, 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 it's a mile away from the barbel yeah. fishing that, that we used to have at home, but Sadly, we haven't got it anymore, so yeah. this is our, our option. <laughs> so I guess the you know the first thing is with sort of any any type of fishing really is is location. You know, I guess you can turn up here and you can. It's quite intimidating, I guess. You know, yeah. as, as a place to if you've never been here. And so I think there's something in the region of about 300 pegs along these few miles of river. So um, <laughs> it's quite a bit to go it, at. It, it can vary. You get when you get flood water conditions and low water conditions different pegs can be the, the ones to fish. Um, when it's in low water, I tend to look for some, some sort of turbulent, some oxygenated water. I mean, the weir pool is the obvious place. Um, coming down the river, bends are another obvious one. Um, the inside of a bend, by the way, the flow carves through the bend, is normally a lot deeper. Um, and that deeper inside edge is normally a lot faster water comes around there and, and the barbel just seem to like sitting in that with that consistent fast flow going over their heads. Yeah you'll normally find a nice crease on the inside of the bend where that fast water meets the slack and the fish just any fish not just barbel if you're fishing a river and you're trotting along creases or, a, yeah they're, they're a good natural yeah, natural yeah. feature i notice where we're where we're fishing today the river comes round the bend here and all along this side you can you know noticeably see it, it's a lot deeper and i guess this i guess it sort of bore it out yeah you know well, our side of the bank chose this swim there's there's slack water on the far bank and under our feet it's that little bit deeper and it's a nice steady glide um, and it just it just I don't know it's, it's sometimes difficult to explain to Ex people yeah. but when you fish the rivers quite a lot you just get an eye and you think that you looks think that spot. It's, looks fishy yeah yeah so. it's the combination of what the flow is doing and, and what the flow has done to the depth yeah and, um, yeah. yeah so I guess the next thing mates you find your swim I mean, tackle-wise, what sort of things are you using? You know, I said, like, you know, everything's stepped up a little bit. Yeah, as I mentioned, a, a normal conventional feeder rod would pretty much be a waste of time here, even if it was in low water conditions. The, the smallest feeder you're probably going to put on on this stretch would be three ounces. Really? And with any amount of flood water pushing through you, sometimes you, you struggle to hold with five and six ounces really? when in the autumn when it's in flood. Therefore, you need a rod that can cast it. Yeah. Um, these rods we're using are a a 13 foot two and a half pound tesco dedicated sort of big river barbel rod um, it just makes everything so much easier casting the feeder out you know they've got nice big guides on them for quite happily put 15 pound line on them if you needed yeah. to um, it all sounds a bit over the top for barbel but you hook a, a big barbel in a strong river like this and you need some gear you need, you, it you to, know, you to need get some, it out yeah so i guess what about the actual end tackle keep yourself simple yeah, I use like rig -wise I pr and pretty much use the same rig for all my barbel fishing on these types of rivers, and it's the the, co the core running rig kit. Yeah. Um, the only thing I change, whether it's low water, whether there's a bit of colour, whether I'm fishing in the daytime or at night time, is the bait I use. I quite like to use boilies and pellets and things when there's a bit of colour, or if I'm fishing at night time. But when you're really scratching for bites in low water, and if you're just doing day sessions, I think. Um, casters and maggots and sort of caster and hemp combination can get you extra bites and, and sometimes catch fish that you wouldn't catch if you just sat here with big clumsy boilies and things yeah. on. So I guess you've got obviously you've got the running rig set up and then you've got you got a quick clip on there so you can change between you know you, you can fish a, a block end feeder open end feeder yeah. straight lead if you wanted. I tend to quite like using the block end feeders and I, I don't know if you've noticed, I've drilled the holes out so they're a lot larger on the feeders. Yeah. Because um, I quite like putting the hemp and the caster in the feeder. And it just, uh, just allows the flow to wash yeah, it Yeah, if I hadn't drilled them out quite often, you're reeling for recast and three quarters of your bait it's, would still be still in there. In there. Um, another little edge that I do, I think, makes a difference is I, as well as the feeder to put bait in the swim, I, I, I nick a small PVA bag onto my, my hook bait as well. If, it's, if I'm using, I'll use the, the rubber casters on a hair rig and I'll put a small PVA bag about the size of a golf ball and I just think when it 
settles on the bottom of the river, you've just got a nice patch of casters right, right, with your, right near your hook, right bait. Your hook bait. So, talk, you know, the, act, the actual baiting up, you like to put quite a bit of bait through to swim, you're casting pretty regular. I'll cast, and, yeah, I'll cast a lot more often when I first get here because you're yeah. trying to get some bait in the swim, you know, if, if anything you want to get as much out there as quick as you can. I mean, you, you can use a bait dropper if, if you're fishing close in, you can use a bait dropper to get some bait out there Get yeah, nice, nice and quick, yeah. But, um, uh, kind of the rule of thumb, it, it, it's, you kind of, bit, as soon as you get a bite, you end up casting more often anyhow. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if you're not catching, instead of just sitting there thinking, oh, it's not happening, keep busy. Perhaps keep and yeah, kick, every kick it every off. 25 minutes, have a recast. Keep keep the feeders yeah. working. I noticed, um, you, you know, you mentioned about the the PVA bags as well. I I noticed you were busy tying up a few this morning and and last night. because I guess it's good to have some ready. If that does happen, you can cast regularly, not wasting time out of the water. If all of a sudden you do get a you know, yeah. sort of run a fish come through. The, the one thing that you have to bear in mind, if you with the little PVA bags of just the casters, um, if you was to tie six or eight up and just leave them on your bucket lid under your brolly, because um, they're a live thing, they'll start to turn and they'll darken off and a, a dark caster is a floating caster. Yeah. Yeah. So one little tip is I bring some little um, sealable plastic bags and when I've tied half a dozen, I put them in the bag and just seal it airtight. Just keeps and then it just, you know, it just pauses yeah. the turning process and they're ready, you know, they're not going to be wasted. Yeah, and I, I guess the the last thing we sort of um, touched on it a little bit hook bait wise, you're using boilies and caster. What sort of you know length hook length are you using? You're using a little short, you know, because you're not like using a bolt rig as such, are you? I mean, they they do bolt and hook themselves just because the whole setup is under so much tension yeah. because of the flow and the size of you. You know, they'll actually pick the bait and, and almost off the resistance of the rod tip, they'll hook they'll themselves. Hook themselves. Um, one tip I find is I use long hook links on these rivers, uh, you know, minimum of four foot long. Um, I always compare it to when a carp angler uses a back lead to pin his line down. If you imagine your feeder on the bottom of the river and your tight line is going down to your feeder, if your hook bait was six inches a foot away from that feeder, they're constantly going to be knocking against the main line and spooking and you're going to get false bites. Um, if you fish a long hook link, because of the flow it gets pinned flat to the bottom of the river, and you know they can move around over your hook bait and feed on top of it without knocking the main line. Yeah. Um, and you haven't got no way. You, you, some people may think, well, but your hook bait's miles away from your feeder, but the, the bait is going to come out of that feeder and in this flow is going to just trickle down. Trundle your down hook anyway. To, yeah. And I, I guess as well with that, hopefully you can bring a few fish up river, you know, and come and investigate and yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully uh, pick up your bait and yeah, you're in. But we're uh, we've still got a bit of time, so. I reckon um, we'll get some fresh baits out there and see if we can't nick a, another one or two. Fingers crossed. Yeah.